the book of Romans, chapter number 4. And we're going to do something tonight that we don't normally do, and let's read the passage. Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 9. In the King James Bible, it begins with the word cometh. Is that where you are tonight? Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When it was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which had not yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. You might want to underscore that in your Bible. The father of all them that, that believe, though they be not circumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had been, being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith, and that it is might be of gr by grace, to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is a father of us all. Twice in that passage, he refers to Abraham as a father of all who believe. As it is written, verse 17, I have made these a father of many nations. If you notice, that should be in parenthesis in your Bible. Do you have that parenthesis there? It means it's not in the original manuscripts, but it was added to later in order to make the verse kind of meaningful. He says, before him who is believed, he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead. I want you to underscore that, red line it, highlight it, yellow light it, um, and put a glowing light on it. Who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Father in heaven, I pray for your Holy Spirit right now to come and not only to be the interpreter, but the communicator of truth. And would you anoint this voice that it might be used of you tonight to expose and ex express that which the the Apostle Paul intended, the Holy Spirit intended in the writing of this, of this very crucial, yet sometimes difficult to understand passage. And would you anoint the ears of those who've gathered to hear, and those who've gathered by any other means at whatever time. Would you allow them to sense your presence today and become, be, become the teacher, the guider of the Word of God. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, all right. Now, with your Bibles open to Romans 4, Let's review a little bit of this biblical truth the Apostle Paul is making here and has made in verse 1 through 8. Abraham was justified by his faith and not by his works. If you look back in in verse 12, or excuse me, verse 1 and 2, verse 1 and 2 he says this, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Now Paul wrote, that they were saved by grace through faith plus nothing. And while some of them wanted to believe what Paul said there, they also believed that they would be judged by their works as they believed their father in faith Abraham was judged by his works. Now this is a big issue today. It's not just a big issue among the Jews. It's a big issue among Protestants. Because some, there are a lot of denominations out there, a lot of pastors, a lot of churches, some non-denominational, who want to say grace plus. Well, if it's grace plus anything, it's not grace. If you add anything to the grace, it's no longer grace. See, they thought Abraham was chosen of God because of his character. And sometimes when we're teaching the Bible stories, we put a lot of emphasis upon the human character rather than the God who called the human character and worked his will through that human character. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, there's the heroes of the faith. Yes, by faith they did this, by faith they did that, by faith they did the other. But notice if you go back to the original story, it was God who worked that faith, that, art, that item of faith in their life. 
See, they thought Abraham was chosen of God because he was a good man. They thought and had been taught that he was a perfect man. And that's why God chose him to be the father of the nation of Israel. Well, so Paul asked them there in verse 2, what did Abraham gain with God because of the works of the flesh? And, and you can see where Paul's trying to get here. He said, okay, if we're saved by grace then, so what, what difference did it make what Abraham did or did not do in the flesh? Now hold on to that. Verse 2, for Ab if Abraham were justified by works, okay, he's in glory in himself, but you can't glory before God. The most perfect man who ever lived, or a woman who ever lived, cannot stand before the Lord and say, I'm saved because of what I did and who I am. Because if, if anybody can save by their works, then obviously they, there's no need for grace. So Abraham might be able to stand before the nation of Israel <clears throat> and boast of the ways God used him, and he did use him in a mighty way. Nobody's doubting that. But he could not stand before God and expect to be accepted into heaven because he lived a good life and because he did everything that God asked him to do. Even Abraham knew that wasn't true. So then in verse 3, Paul asked, well, what saith the scripture? <clears throat> Abraham believed God <clears throat> and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham believed God and that faith in God was counted as if he was as righteous as he needed to be. Now, folks, this is a, <clears throat> pardon my voice tonight, this, folks, this truth is important to a proper understanding of what it means to be saved by grace, through faith, and not of works, lest any man would boast. We cannot do one thing to gain acceptance with God. It's just not possible. God is pleased when we are obedient to Him, but we, there's nothing we can do to earn or deserve our salvation that God's freely given to us by His grace. Tonight, that was one of the lessons in the Behold Your God series. God loves us unconditionally because, if we're, because He loves His Son unconditionally, and if we are in His Son, then He also loves us unconditionally. And that's a hard concept to grab a hold of. Chapter 3, verse 20 says that all, Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. So a person might be able to stand before their employer at the end of the week and say, well, listen, I demand the wages for the work that I've done, and look what a great job I've done. But no one is going to be able to stand before the Lord on that day and tell God they have earned their place in heaven because nobody, no one can come to God on their own terms. Now, this is deep theology, and I know it's Sunday night, and I know your minds are at ease, but you've got to put your thinking caps on a little bit tonight for another 45 minutes or so, okay? Picture your stand, yourself standing before the Lord, and, and hear, can you hear yourself saying this? Now, I grew up in a Christian home, Lord, you know that. I always believed in you. I accepted Christ as my Savior when I was a child, and, and I never, never got involved in the gross sins like the other people did. And I've always gone to church on Sunday, sang in the choir, children's choir, youth choir, adult choir. And uh, I, w I traveled on mission trips. I, I was perfect in my uh, Sunday school attendance for 15 or 20 years. I, I know I haven't done always er like you want me to do. I've never been totally obedient. I know that. But, Lord, you know that I've tried to be good. Now, that's a good, you know, how many of us grew up thinking we had to be good little boys and girls? Be good, be, good, be a good little boy now, be a good little girl now. And you see, if God accepts us into heaven on the basis of our goodness, um, we get the credit for that. Um, we get the glory for that. If there's anything we can do to earn it or to deserve it. But God is not in the business of glorifying men. Not Abraham, not Isaac, not Jacob, not Moses, not David, not Paul, not anybody. God is not in the business of glorifying men. Therefore, nobody, not even Abraham, will be made right with God by his or her works. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And listen to me, and if you go back and read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, in the original language, he says, even that faith, it's not of ourselves. It, too, is a gift of God, not as a result of our works, lest we boast about our faith. And you have that going on today in a lot of the Pentecostal churches. They would boast about their great faith. So salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. 
So lost man is justified by God on the basis of one thing and one thing only, by his faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ plus nothing. Now, hold on to that because that's going to get a little bit um, muddy here, and then we'll try to clean up the mud before we leave tonight. The essence of Abraham's greatness was that he believed God, and that's faith. He believed God. Now, here's what faith is talking about. Faith is taking God and his word and then acting upon it. Taking God and his word and then acting upon that word. He's responding in faith, believing that God would be true to his word. That's what saving faith is all about. In God's sovereignty, he called Abraham to carry out a divine purpose, a divine plan, a work that God designed even before the foundation of the world, and he called Abraham to, to complete that plan. So Abraham heard the call of God. He took God at his word. He packed up all of his stuff and put the animals in the, the camels in the road and trusted God to show him where he was going to go. So that is an extra measure of faith. He didn't know where he was going, but he said, I'm going. And it, that was not just Abraham and a few other camels. It was his whole entourage. And it was a big deal because they had to take food and water and everything else for their travel. And so Abraham heard the call, and he didn't, he didn't question the call. He took God at his word, that's faith. He packed all of his stuff on the camels, and they put them in the wind, really. And God took that act of faith and counted it uh, and considered it or accepted it as if Abraham was as righteous as God. He took that faith that Abraham was made acceptable unto God, and that's the basic doctrine of salvation. It's not something we can do. It's our faith in that which has already been done. But it's not just a simple, oh, I believe that intellectually. I believe that mentally. No, it is, it is taking God and his word and then responding or acting upon that faith. So how can a man be right with God? How can a man's sins be forgiven? How can a man be accepted into God's kingdom? Well, not by his own works, that's for sure, but by what he believes. It is the exercise of his faith in what God has said, but the exercise of that faith, again, is not just mental agreement. It's putting that faith into practice, putting that faith into action. God counts the faith, our faith in Christ as the righteousness of Christ and his account with God is justified. So if Christ is justified with God, then he is, then if I'm in Christ, then I'm fully justified before God. I don't want to make it light of this, but you've heard me say it before. If I am in Christ tonight, it's just if I'd never sinned. That's a hard concept to swallow, is it not? Because we know that we're still sinners. Uh, you know that, I know that. And I know that about you, and you know that about me. We're still sinners saved by grace. But if I'm in Christ tonight, and Christ is in me, then the holiness of Christ, uh, uh, Christ has taken my sinfulness and given me his holiness. And therefore, I'm accepted by the Father because of my faith in the finished work of Christ. That's salvation. Now, one more thing before we move on, because I don't want to be misunderstood here tonight. This is deep theology. When I say the word faith here, I'm not talking about wishful thinking. I'm not talking about faith is not, I believe, for every drop of rain that flows, a flower grows. That's pure, utter nonsense. That's just uh, some side of trying to make up a rhyme for a song. Faith is not, I believe, that someone in the great somewhere, that's pure daydreaming. That's, um, that's taking a concept of Scripture, if you will, and turning it into romanticism, those kinds of things. Saving faith is simply our hand reaching out to take the gift that God is offering. Now, I'm going to do something here. Mr. Moore, would you walk up here just for a second? Come on up here just for a second. Okay, hand right there. Now, what, what did you do to receive that pen? Well, you reached out and grabbed it, didn't you? But it was all, it was re, it, you reached out and grabbed it because why? Because I offered it. You all ready for this? Thank you. God doesn't respond to our faith by giving us salvation. Our faith responds to God's gift of salvation. And let's let that settle for a while. 
What did he do? He walked up and received the gift that was offered. And that's God's gift of salvation to those who will receive it. God's gift of salvation to those who will receive it. One more time, it's God's gift of salvation to those who will what? Just receive it and then act upon it. So if God always takes the initiative. He doesn't take it back, by the way, like I took the pen back. But you get the illustration. Now, there's a second element in that process of justification, and it's called God's grace. Some call it God's undeserved favor, and that's okay. Some call it the desire and power to be obedient to God, and that's great. But grace is all that, but it's a lot more than that. The bottom line is grace means we get what God wants us to have without having to do anything to obtain it, or otherwise it would not be grace. If your insurance company gives you 30-day grace to pay your bill, you didn't earn it or deserve that. You may have been a good customer for 20 years, but they gave it to you because of the grace. They gave you the grace period. It's a free gift of God's heart of love, not something earned or deserved. Um, and, 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 and it comes because of our faith in the express person of Jesus Christ. So we're living by God's grace. Every day is a day of grace. We're living, some people don't think that there are different epochs of time, and I differ with that because this is the day of grace. This is the age of the Holy Spirit. This is the age of the church. A lot different than that. So we're living in the day of grace. Now, the first thing Paul wants us to see about this grace is in verse 9 through 17. Again, hard to difficult, tough, tough scripture to read here, but it's hang with me. Abraham was not justified by physical circumcision. That's verse 9 through 12. That's what Paul's trying to say. So Paul is trying to convince people who lived for hundreds of years believing that Abraham, the sign of salvation for Abraham was a circumcision. That's what they tried to believe. And Paul said, no, 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 no. If it was by grace alone, through his faith alone, then you've got to put circumcision over here by itself. It had nothing to do with his salvation. It may have been an evidence of or an application of, but it was not contingent upon his circumcision. Now most Jews in the New Testament time were convinced that circumcision was not only the unique mark that set them apart from all the other um, races, but uh, that it was also the means by which the Jew was made acceptable unto God, which is why it was, it was um, important, not only important, but it was, it was necessary that the males be circumcised. But Paul made it clear, Abraham was counted righteous when he, it wasn't when he circumcised, but when he believed God. When he took God at his word and he acted upon that word, he acted in faith on what God was said was true. And the fact was Abraham was counted righteous long before the ritual of circumcision was instituted. And Paul proved that right here in that verse. It was most difficult to read. Abraham was circumcised when he was 99 years of age. Ishmael, by the way, was 13 years old when this occurred. Abraham was declared righteous by God before Ishmael was born or even conceived, according to Genesis 15, 6. So if you go, don't turn back to that, but that's, you got to prove Scripture with Scripture here. So Abraham was declared righteous before God at least 14 years before he was circumcised. Abraham was in God's covenant and under God's grace long before he was physically circumcised. So circumcision became the mark of the covenant relationship between God and his people. But the covenant was not established on the basis of Abraham's circumcision, but upon the basis of their faith in God, which led them to the obedience of circumcision. Abraham was circumcised as, as an outward evidence of an inward obedience unto God. Verse 11, that's what Paul said. In plain southern language, Abraham was circumcised as an outward evidence of his inward obedience unto God. That sign also became a seal, a covenant between the Hebrews and God, a reminder of God's cutting away of the flesh. That was what it was for. It had nothing to do with their salvation, their eternal security, but it was a sign. What I'm saving you to cut you away from the flesh, to get you to cut away from the flesh, and to enjoy the gift of righteousness. Now Abraham's right of circumcision which again, this cutting away of the flesh, is equal to baptism. It's equal to baptism in the life of a true believer. Baptism should be the first step of faith for a new believer. 
I've always believed in that. I will continue to believe in that, but baptism doesn't save you. This is good, just good old um, water from, some, from somewhere. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, Paul linked water baptism with circumcision as a sign of redemption. It's not leading up to salvation. It's not leading up to redemption. It's the evidence of being redeemed. It's the evidence of salvation. Uh, Paul said it this way in Colossians 2. We're buried with Christ. We're buried with Christ in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who have raised us or raised him from the dead. Now in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when Peter finished the first sermon ever preached by layman, underscore that, preached the first sermon ever preached by layman, and the people asked him, okay, we've heard you, Peter, we're convicted, now you tell us what to do. And what did Peter say? Well, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, we could spend an hour on that, but that's not for the purpose of this sermon. Peter said baptism was the initial sign of genuine salvation. In other words, it was the outward evidence of an inward conversion. I have died to myself. I no longer live, but now Christ lives in me. And, and as the song we sang a moment ago, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Bring it down one more notch, honey. Being dipped in water didn't save them. Being dipped in water doesn't save anybody. But their willingness to be baptized revealed their desire for genuine repentance from sin. And that's what the baptism of pool is for. Now, there are many evangelicals out there, many people out today, who base their whole salvation, the assurance of their salvation, on water baptism. Uh, but that can't be. It can't be. You understand that. Or the thief on the cross would not be saved. You understand that. A lot of people used to base it on did you come, come to Sunday school three Sundays in a row and keep a perfect attendance for a year? That has nothing to do with anything. Uh, that's just religion. There are many evangelicals who believe their children are, are secured eternally by some church covenant through infant baptism. But that can't be because the infant cannot understand the fact that their sin nature, their need for a Savior, and cry out for God to send them a Savior. They can't do that. So that's why in this church we have what is called a parent-child dedication service rather than a, a child baptism or whatever. I don't want parents to think that um, any type of service that we could have in this church is any more than their recognition of their responsibility to be God's instruments in their children's lives and to bring that child up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord which to which they, for which they will give an account unto God. So that in God's timing, that child will see God for who he is and see himself for who he is, his need for a Savior, and realize he needs a Savior. And then maybe God, uh, maybe the, the father and the mother, along with the church or whatever, Sunday school teacher or whatever the case might be, might talk to them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they may have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ since they were nine months old. That's all right. But that child must come to the realization of their own sin nature, their need for a Savior, and cry out unto God for salvation. That's required of everybody that's saved. You, no matter whether or not you're baptized, but baptism ought to be the first evidence of that. Then the message of salvation by grace through faith can penetrate their hearts to the work of the Holy Spirit, and they can receive God's gift of salvation by faith just like everybody else. I've shared this a couple of times already, but it was shared with us in a recent conversation. A family was in their sofa in their living room just having a quiet time, having their family devotions at night. And all of a sudden their seven-year-old son just got up and went into his room. And they didn't bother him. They didn't talk to him or whatever. And all of a sudden he came by and he said, I've asked Jesus Christ to come in my heart. In other words, something out of that family devotions pricked his heart. And he began to understand that he too was a Savior, even though he's been brought up in a, in, in a very devout Christian home. He understood his need for a Savior and he cried out, for God to send him a Savior, and he received Christ as his Savior because he had heard that Jesus Christ had come to save us from our sins. Now, as the first man to be justified by grace through faith, Abraham became the father of all believers, verse 12. I've asked you to underscore that because I probably will insert a sermon in the series in not too short a time about replacement theology because it's beginning to... Uh, make me mad now because so many preachers are preaching this that I, I've got to make this clear. 
And so I'll probably insert that in somewhere in November, December. But um, Abraham became the father of all believers, verse 12. He became the pattern, he became the picture, he became the standard, the father of all believers, those who are circumcised and those who are not circumcised. He is our father too. He is our father too if we walk in his steps by faith, not because of a circumcision, not because of what he did, but because of how he did it and for whom he did it, by faith. If we take God at his word, as Abraham did, if we act in obedience to what he calls us to do, as Abraham did, then we're following the pattern of our father Abraham. The Bible says we're saved by what? We're saved by faith. Circumcision and baptism are simply signs of our faith. We don't have to be baptized to be saved any more than a Jew would have to be circumcised to be a part of God's covenant people. Both are acts of obedience based upon their faith in God's Word. Therefore, we put no confidence in the flesh. I don't put any confidence in baptism. How many people were baptized, uh, but, you, but you never see them again? In fact, it is a part of the minutes of the deacons meeting of Trinity Baptist Church in Casey, South Carolina. They, they couldn't build, because of our low numbers, they wouldn't let us build a church building looking like a church. It had to be built like a business. And so as a result of that, we could not put a steeple or a cross on the top of the building. So they built a cross tower just outside the building. And of course, it became a resting place for the pigeons. Well, we tried everything in the world to get rid of those pigeons. They put little snakes up there. They did all the stuff, put the little prongs up there because you know what was happening down on the, on the walkway, don't you? So it is in the minutes of the deacons meeting. If we will enroll those pigeons in Sunday school and baptize them, we will never see them again. And that's, that, so that is in the minutes of, the, of that deacon's meeting. I kid you not. Uh, <laughs> Y'all laugh at that, but I'm not joking. It is, it's for real. But how many people have you known to be baptized, but you never see them again? Right? So baptism is not going to save you. So we don't have to be baptized anymore to be saved, any more than a Jew would have to be circumcised. They're acts of obedience based upon our faith in God's Word. Therefore, we put no confidence in these fleshly things. Our confidence in these outward signs and these symbols or rites or ceremonies, that's just religion. It's, it's added to salvation by grace alone through our faith alone in Christ alone. Don't add anything to it. And it's all empowered by and a result of the inner working of the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with anything else. You understand that? So the point Paul is making here is that Abraham was not justified by the right of circumcision, but rather, secondly, Abraham was not justified by the law either. Look in verse 13 and 14. Again, the chronology of the Scriptures proves this point. The promise God made to Abraham, the promises that God made to him, were not based upon his ability to keep the Mosaic law, which had not even been established yet, my goodness, but upon God's covenant with his people. It was based upon the covenant God made with his people, and on this particular case, it was an unconditional covenant. And the promise involved four things, contrary to what you're hearing in the news today. It, it also involved, first of all, a land. If you want to write, I may have written this down in your study guide, Genesis 15, 18 to 21. Did I write that down? Genesis 15, 18 to 21. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying unto thy seed, have I given this land? Will somebody get that to the United Nations? I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. I noticed um, French President Macron reminded Bibi Netanyahu this week that, well, Israel was only a nation because the United Nations made it a nation. You better go back and read the Bible, sir. You better go back and read Egyptian uh, hieroglyphics and everything because Israel's been a nation long before you were even thought about being born. But there, it, it involves the land, number two, it involves a people. Genesis 13, 16 and 15, 5, And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. And he brought him for, forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, So shall thy seed be. That's how many Jews there will be in the world. And uh, not only during this life, but in the millennium. How about a blessing? Genesis 12, 3. I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. 
I don't want to get involved in what's going on too much today, but there are stories out even tonight that uh, somebody in the Pentagon leaked Israel's battle plan to have, have, have leaked Israel's battle plan to the Iranians. Folks, I'm telling you, if America turns its back upon Israel, um, we've had troubles before, but we've never seen any troubles like we're going to have if that if that's finds out to be the case. And then finally, a redeemer, Genesis 22, 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And we went through that the other night when, when um, he was about to sacrifice Isaac and there was a ram caught in the thicket, the picture of Christ with the head of the thorns. Now, let me ask you a question tonight. Which of those four things did Abraham see fulfilled in his life? Well, as I say, in North Carolina, nary a one of them. So what did Abraham do to earn the promise of God? What did Abraham do to earn the promise of God? Nothing. God's covenant with Abraham was based entirely upon the sovereign choice of God, the sovereign will of God. It was God's choice of Abraham, not Abraham's choice of God. Yes, he left his father's faith. He left his father's family. He left his father's fortune. He left it all back, but he took Lot with him, which was a problem, which was, which was a mistake. But anyway, it was God. Who, who, who called whom? Did Abraham say, God, is there anything I can do for you? Or did God say, Abraham, I need, I need you to do something for me? God called Abraham. Abraham simply responded to God's call. He responded to God's invitation to become involved in what he was doing in the world. And God wanted to do it through him. Henry Blackie said the same thing about Moses. He says, uh, God told Moses, look, Moses, I've, I've been involved in the world for a long time. I need you to do this now to carry forward my plan for the future of the world. And that's the same thing Abraham did before Moses. So Abraham simply responded to God's invitation to do what needed to be done at that time. And God wanted to do that through his father, through Abraham. Abraham was justified because he believed in God's promise. But belief was more than just mental assent. His belief was an active obedience to what God said to do. And Paul has, oh, Paul has already said this, that belief, that faith, that act of faith that resulted in his obedience was reckoned to Abraham as if he was just as righteous as God. And folks, we have a hard time understanding that. We say, that's so simple. Yeah, it's simple. But it's also, it, it, it wasn't cheap. Uh, that, that cost the very blood of, 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 of the only Son of God. Therefore, the promise God made to Abraham would be handed down, again, not by human descent to the bloodline only, but by spiritual descent to those who follow the example of that faith. And when you, when you teach this story to your children, that's what you need to teach. Yes, it was the faith of Abraham, but look at the evidence of that faith, not just the faith, not just good feelings and good thoughts and, and good plans, no, good ideas but it was the manifestation of his faith in the act of obedience. Therefore, when a person believes God's promise of salvation through their faith alone, in the finished work of Christ alone, that act of faith is considered or counted unto them as if we were just as righteous as Christ. If I, if I believe tonight that Jesus died for my sins, and I receive him as my Savior, as Mr. Moore received that pen a moment ago, that I am as righteous as the one who saved me. Now get a hold of that tonight. Get a hold. Now th that some say, well, you're giving us a license to sin. No, I'm not. No, <laughs> if, you, if you partake of that righteousness, then by that same righteousness you need to live. Now you can't live it up to the measure of Christ. That's why we're saved by grace. But yet at the same time, it ought to motivate us to become like conformed to the image of the one who saved us. So Abraham was not justified by the right of circumcision nor was he justified by his obedience to the Mosaic law. Abraham was justified by God's grace. Look in verse 16 and 17. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. Wow, you ready for that? Therefore, it is by faith that it might be by grace. Let me give you the Amplified Bible. And by the way, I would encourage you to pick up one of those at a bookstore if you can find one, the Amplified Bible. Therefore, I'm giving it verb, a word for word out of the Amplified Bible tonight. Therefore, inheriting the promise 
is the outcome of faith, and it depends entirely on faith in order that it might be given as an act of grace. And what is grace? It's unmerited favor. To make it stable and valid and guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the devotees and adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, who is thus the father of us all. Now that's just the amplified version of verses 16 and 17. So faith makes, y'all ready for this? Say amen. You got your, you got your old, old um, radio voice here. You got, your, you got your ears on. Faith makes the promise available. Faith makes the promise available to everyone. Everyone will be saved by grace through faith plus nothing. So faith makes the promise available to everyone. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. But it's God's grace that makes the salvation accessible to everyone. For if it was not for God's sovereign grace in offering us the salvation, there will be nothing for us to have faith in. Do you understand that? So it was God's grace who offered it. It was our faith, it was by faith that we received it. So we're saved by grace, through faith, and even that faith is not of our own working it up and conjuring up some sort of faith, some sort of mental exercise here. That too is a gift of God, not as a result of our works. That's, again, one would boast about, I have more faith than you. And Jesus said, well, all it takes is the faith of a mustard seed, so why are you boasting about your faith? A preacher once said, faith is able to receive anything God promises, but if that promise is only received by those who be expected to keep some kind of law, then the promise is nullified. And this is what many people are being taught in, in many churches today. Oh, yeah, you're saved by grace, but now you've got to live up to the law. Now, you, oh, yeah, you're saved by grace, but here's, if you don't keep these five things, no, 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 that, that we ought to, there are many more than five things that we ought to do, but none of them are going to enhance the grace of God. A preacher said that, well, faith is able to receive anything God promises. Really? Religions are based upon legalism. Um, and if a person fails in one area, they think they are damned forever. But if legalism is the only way any of us will ever be saved, then we're all doomed. We're all doomed because none of us can keep that all the time. And the whole Bible, well, it doesn't make any sense. Because why? Because it's a picture of God's grace. And we'll see that in the way he's treating the Jews at this moment. Yes, they rejected Jesus Christ. And they walked away from Christ. They're probably totally apostate, except for the true believers there. But uh, God says, I'm not through with them. There will t be a time when they will repent and return to me. And again, as I told the class tonight, we better be thankful for that. Because if God abandoned us every time we rejected Christ, where would we be? So he's using, the, he's using his love for the Jews and his grace to the Jews to show us uh, his grace towards us when we're disobedient to him. You see, if, if, um, if it's legalism, think about this tonight. If it's legalism, then where's the need for the cross? Uh, where's the need for a church? Um, if there's no hope beyond our ability to keep somebody else's set of rules here, um, we're, we're in trouble. And that's, that's salvation is not about that. Salvation is not about keeping somebody's set of rules. Salvation is all about grace, and therefore it's available to everybody because nobody can be disqualified because of their sin. And I, I, I just want to stop and think about that. There's no sin so great that it cannot be forgiven by God's grace. The only unpardonable sin is the rejection of God's salvation through grace. The only unpardonable sin is the continual rejection of Jesus Christ as one Savior until they pass away. Otherwise, there's no sin that cannot be forgiven by God's grace. Isn't that wonderful tonight? My sin of the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole, is what is nailed to the cross, said the next line, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. You see, it's available to those who grew up under the law, that means the Jews. And I'm telling you, when you see a, a Jewish person who lived the Jewish law, uh, understand God's grace, uh, it's like turning something loose that, that's been tied down for years. Uh, they just they want to kick and spit and holler and hoop hot and hadn't sing hallelujah for an hour or more because they've been under the bondage of that law, and now they understand that God's grace has given them freedom 
and they, they can't understand it. It's available to those who don't have a religious heritage. It's available to those of us who didn't have a Christian heritage. Uh, it's available to those who just heard, again, sermonettes for Christianettes all of our life. Uh, it, it, that's talking about the Gentiles. We've, been grow we've grown up in a quasi-Christian nation uh, and a quasi-Christian church, if you will. And as long as we kept these 10 or 15 things and we were good Christians, when in reality, we were no more saved than a bent nail. But because once we understood the gospel and we understand, wait a minute, there's a little bit difference between the church's understanding of salvation that I've heard all my life and what the Bible says. And when we understand what the Bible says, that we're saved by grace through faith plus nothing, it's a gift of God. That's a whole lot different from what I heard in my church. I don't know about your church. And verse 17 seals the deal. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which would be not as though they were. Mr. Moore was sitting on his seat. He had, ho had no idea that I was going to call him up here until I called him. And that's what he's talking about. Before him who believed, even God who did what? Who quickened the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Well, last week I gave you my definition of the acrostic faith. F-A-I-T-H is this, facts. Yes, there must be some facts. There must be biblical truth. And you have, you, you, you're charged with making sure that what is said in here is absolute truth with no mixture of error. And so those facts, it's not just religiosity. It's not just religious uh, jargon. Uh, it's not something you can wear around your neck or on a bracelet or on, on your bumper sticker. No, you have to go back to the facts, the biblical truth, the, the uh, doctrines that we recite every Sunday morning. So then you must accept those facts. One must accept those biblical truths as being worthy of our faith. And uh, again, I go, I go back and ask you, when we start reading the creed, oh, what, a part, what is it about that creed you don't agree with? Well, you better think about through every little part of that because those, every, the agreement with every uh, one of those doctrines is essential to the Christian faith, not just the part that you've been told, but the part that is explained in the whole in that, uh, in that reading. So you have to accept those facts. And then not only just accept them mentally, but you have to internalize them. In the internalization of those facts, which would include, okay, if this is true, then I'm a sinner. And I need a Savior. And so I'm going to repent of my sins. And as a result of that repentance, I'm going to do several things. Number one, I'm going to uh, confess my sins. I'm going to confess the sin as far as it in affected those people involved in it. And if I've done something to take anything away from them, whether it's demean their character or stolen from them, stolen emotions or whatever, I'm going to, going to restore those things that I can, but I'm going to reconcile with them which would then lead to trust. So your facts, acceptance, internalization, and then trust, which is the same thing as faith, and then hope. Believing in what God's Word says until He, in His own way, makes what He says so. Again, there's a little bit late at night to get that deep, but we take God at His Word that this is going to happen until it happens. We take God that is word that is going to take us out of this world before the tribulation. That's God's word. And guess what? I'm going to believe in God until we're taken up. Are you? We, go, we take God's word that he's coming again. And we're going to be coming with him to rule and reign with him on this earth for a thousand years. We're taking him at his word. Say it, until it happens. That's what, that's what it means. Now tonight I want to give you my definition of the word grace. The acrostic of grace. G-R-A-C-E. Some say grace is God's riches at Christ's expense, and that's a wonderful definition. Let me give you a better one. Grace is God's righteousness at Christ's expense. It's God's righteousness at Christ's expense. Righteousness is what he gave to us the very moment we believed in his word and acted upon that word. We were made acceptable unto God forever. We were adopted into God's family. He cannot unadopt us. Therefore, we belong to him, and he belongs to us. And then God's, God's salvation is all of God. God takes the initiative in our salvation. God's so love, that means he took the initiative. And then righteousness, that which makes us acceptable. Absolute righteousness. 
When he looks at me, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And then at, salvation is through Christ and Christ alone. And then Christ, by his stripes, we were healed. And then expense, even the death of the cross. So you have, you have, um, you have God's righteousness at Christ's expense. Now, if you knew that tonight, wouldn't you want to live in obedience to the one who's given you that which you can never earn by any other way? And that's the motivation, the intrinsic motivation to live in obedience to Christ. The systems of religion today have one thing in common, whether we're talking about liberal Protestantism or Roman Catholicism or Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses or Christian science or, or the Eastern religions of Buddhism and Hinduism and all the others, even Islam, all the religions of the world are based upon their obedience to somebody's list of rules. They, they will not allow their followers to even hear, much less read, the Word of God. Why? Because they've got them pinned down. They've got them under the bondage to those religious formulas of faith. And they're, they're, they're committed to it. They will not bow down before that. In Guadalupe, Mexico, there's a Catholic site where Mary supposedly appeared many years ago. Today, those who follow this teaching crawl on their hands and knees for a quarter of a mile to this shrine, trying to prove their heart's desire to honor Mary as well as the Catholic Church. Those who have observed this movement say that by the time those pilgrims get to the holy site, their hands and knees are cut and bleeding to the point that they need medical attention. Folks, it's silliness. That's stupidity. That is absolute nonsense. In India, Hindus hold a celebration every 12 years at the Ganges and Yamuna River. One of those holy books declares that those who bathe there during the ceremony will go to heaven. And believers in this lie sit on beds of nails and they walk through fiery coals. They shave every hair of their body, including their eyebrows and eyelashes, because they're taught that every hair that's dumped into the river guarantees them a million years in heaven. Some even starve themselves to death, hoping their penance or self-sacrifice will bring them endless years of utter joy on the other side because that's what they've been told, that's what they've been published by their leader, and their leaders will never, ever allow them to read the Word of God. Other religious groups may demand more or less physical expression, but I hope you're going to see tonight that any person who puts their trust in any other ceremony, any other symbolism, any other methodology, any other rule of law, they nullify the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Listen, if they could be saved by, if, if we could be saved by any other thing, any other method, do you really think that God would have sent his son to die for our sins? Absolutely not. Salvation isn't grace plus something. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And Paul said it in Galatians 5, 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means a thing, but faith working through love. Faith working through love. And that faith, not of ourselves, it too is a gift of God. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for a wonderful day in the house of the Lord. Thank you for your truth that sets us free from the lies of the evil one. And Lord, it inspires us to walk closer to you. Thank you, Lord, that you've allowed us to do that. You welcome us in your sight. You'll never turn us away. You love us like you love your son because we are, in fact, your children. You've adopted us in your family. And, Lord, I pray that in the morning as we wake up and we see another day that we simply do what the Master told us to do, to reach down and pick up our own cross daily and die to ourselves and simply allow you to live your life through us, that others might see Jesus in us and be brought to him before it's too late. Lord, we are expecting some very difficult days ahead. I, I'm not prophesying them. I'm not predicting them. I don't even desire them. I don't want them, but I know that something has to bring the body of Christ to its knees. And all throughout the Old Testament, you have allowed unbelieving nations to chastise the nation that you called to believe in you. And you called America to be the different nation in this world. And I think somewhere along the wayside, we have forgotten that. And we've put you aside and said, we don't need you anymore. We we, we are where we are by our own intellect and our own knowledge and our own skills in the Middle East. We don't need God anymore. We need government. Lord, you, you know, I know you will not tolerate 
you will not tolerate your people serving idols. You will not tolerate your people serving false gods. You will bring us to repentance, and you will bring us to our knees one way, shape, or fashion. You will do that. And so we're expecting those things in the days to come. And I thank you for the oneness and the unity that's in this family. If those days do come, we will bind together. We will hold each other up. We will encourage one another. We will strengthen each other. We'll provide for one another until all the provisions are gone. And we believe that with all of our heart, soul, and mind and mind. Thank you for those who've, brought, who, uh, who've been here tonight. Thank you for those who've come, those who've come back to the body of Christ. We thank you for that, Father. We pray your blessings upon all that's been here today and those who, couldn't, who would have been here today if they could have. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.